All right. All right, good morning, everyone. This is a recorded uh, webinar, and uh, it is on a very, very special occasion. Being a Libyan uh, American, uh, and, um, and all of you around on this panel, uh, 10 years ago had witnessed a major event happening. Uh, influenced by what was uh, to be an Arab Spring and a change to a better, uh, there was a revolt that started in the eastern side of Libya and very quickly expanded to become a revolution to topple down a uh, dictator of 42 years, Colonel Gaddafi. Um, Benghazi uh, was threatened at that point, and uh, the, um, the army of Gaddafi were as close as possible to enter the city and... Um, everyone anticipated a major uh, slaughterhouse to occur in Benghazi. It was a decision that was made by uh, United Nations to allow the uh, interference uh, and um, that happened in, on exactly 10 years from today. That had changed the landscape of Libya in a way that nobody had anticipated. And we are now, after 10 years, looking at a country that is really a failed state, a country that has struggled to put together a political uh, solution for the divisions and the conflicts that had occurred since that event happened 10 years ago. There were interventions that were made with good intentions and uh, NATO and the European Union had a major role in changing the status of Libya at that time by force. Um, today we have with us a group of very distinguished individuals who had in one way or another, direct or indirect influence as to what happened that particular day 10 years ago. Uh, I am extremely honored to have with me today uh, Stefano Marcuzzi, who had just released a very interesting book on and describing the NATO action, the European Union's positions throughout the last 10 years, and how this action had influenced what happened in Libya, positively or negatively. Stephanie is very well known to us. He is a very distinguished scholar, and he uh, is now based in the University College in Dublin and um, at the Marie Curie as a fellow and is at the School of Politics and International Relations. His uh, thesis uh, was on military, in military, on military history at the University of uh, Oxford in 2016, under the supervision of Professor Sir Hugh uh, Strachan. The thesis was based on his study of Anglo-Italian relations during the First World War. Um, thereafter, he moved to Florence as the Max Weber Fellow at the European University Institute and was affiliated with the Robert Schumann Center for Advanced Studies. He worked on EU-NATO Mediterranean relations after 9-11 under the mentorship of Luigi Narbonne and Oliver Roy Peary. Marcosi is an analyst for the NATO Defense College Foundation in Rome and a member mm -hmm. of the Globalizing and Localizing Group on the Great War, uh, GLGW. Uh, the changing character of the war program, CCW, and the Oxford University Strategic Studies Group in Oxford. He is also an external fellow at Boston University. I mean, all this is a wonderful academic background, but for us, it is reading his book that he has just published and the wealth of science, thorough analysis, and details of historic events 
that brings us together today to discuss. Stefano will be giving a brief of his book initially, and then we will be joined by other very distinguished members of this panel, which I would have the honor of introducing as we move forward with it. So Stefano, I don't wanna take your uh, time. Please go ahead and give us an introduction as you will of the book that you have just recently published. Thank you. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you very much indeed uh, to all of you for this opportunity and especially uh, to Johanny and um, Wolfgang for all the efforts you put into banding this together. Um, uh, and thanks to the exceptional uh, group of guests we have here. Uh, I really feel um, grateful and, and honored to be among among you uh, today. Now my book, as you, as you summarized it, um, analyzes the um, decade-long uh, Libyan crisis uh, from the perspectives uh, of NATO and the European Union. Um, in other words, the two main Western-based organizations that have committed themselves to addressing the uh, Libyan crisis at, at various stages in a way or another. Um, of course, NATO played a prominent role in uh, 2011, uh, whereas the EU committed itself to supporting Libya's reconstruction. Um, however, um, the book also reveals why the EU did not take the lead uh, in the anti-Gaddafi intervention uh, itself um, and also evaluates NATO's approach to Libya after, after 2011, because it's not entirely true that NATO left uh, without, without uh, interacting with the Libyan crisis um, since 2011. Now, first of all, um, it is important to remember uh, that the anti-Gaddafi intervention of 2011 was initiated under the, uh, under the um, R2P uh, concept, the responsibility to protect, uh, which intrinsically included the R2R concept as well, the responsibility to rebuild. Um, in that sense, both NATO and the European Union had a moral obligation to uh, help stabilize the country. Um, but that was never done, as everybody knows. And Libya, in fact, descended not into not one, but into two um, further civil wars. Um, this is a failure uh, for which both uh, NATO and the European Union, I think, at least to a certain degree, are and must feel uh, responsible. Um, so the uh, subheading of, of my book, uh, Anatomy of a Failure, um, is blunt, um, but uh, I believe um, justified in that sense. Uh, now, to appreciate the, the root of that failure, we need to... Uh, because many problems... Um, in the management of the of the Libyan crisis uh, in the past 10 years are a direct outgrowth of the issues that had emerged from or uh, of the mistakes that were made during the uh, 2011 operation. Uh, in particular, uh, there was complete disconnect between uh, what some NATO member states wanted in Libya, uh, namely regime change, and what the organization as a whole planned for. Uh, which was the, uh, a predominantly aerial campaign to protect civilians. Um, and this led to a situation where uh, individual member states, uh, namely France and Britain, um, pursued a number of initiatives parallel to that of, of, of the NATO operation, uh, including the arming and training of some rebel factions um, and the deployment of, of special forces, uh, which were seen internationally as a, uh, as a violation of the mandate. Uh, and which alienated, as a consequence, alienated uh, important players, including the African Union and, uh, and Russia. And we can get back to the, the impact of Russia later on. Uh, there was also a tension in 2011 between NATO and the other partners of the coalition, because this was, in fact, not a classic NATO operation, but rather a UN-authorized international intervention led by NATO and using NATO assets. Uh, but the political direction was given to a Libya contact group made of a, a number of different players. Uh, that meant that NATO did not exercise political oversight of non-NATO members, uh, some of which, especially the Qataris and the Emiratis, played a critical role in, in arming the, um, uh, and training the rebels. Uh, but this, in fact, strengthened peripheral forces, peripheral, uh, peripheral uh, elements in the, uh, the anti-Gaddafi uprisings um, and uh, the anti-Gaddafi movement uh, at the expense of unifying forces. Uh, it exacerbated intra-Libyan divisions and rivalries and tied specific militias to foreign patrons that would later use that leverage to wage a proxy war in Libya. Uh, there was also division between the political and the military arms of the alliance, of NATO. Uh, 
um, which, as everybody knows, uh, impeded any serious planning for the uh, day after the end of the official uh, the, the official end of the operation. And finally, uh, NATO did not operate as NATO. Um, only half the allies uh, participated in the operation. Uh, this was essentially a coalition of the willing, uh, but dressed up uh, by by NATO, uh, we might say. Uh, and this allowed uh, most allies to drop any responsibility towards Libya in 2011 and since. Uh, that is a consequence of a lack of a true institutional or organizational commitment. So the way the operation was conducted uh, created the situation and also the dividing lines, uh, I could say, um, along which Libya broke in subsequent years. Um, the, the EU stepped in uh, after the, the end of the war to help stabilize Libya. It did so through uh, its classic toolkit uh, of uh, assistance, financial uh, training and development programs. Um, and the years that followed uh, are a story of a, a short circuit, a short circuit between the EU's foreign policy model or paradigm uh, based on soft power and the needs of a hard security crisis. Um, for the EU, it marked a failure to, ad to adapt and to update its approach when soft power proved insufficient to stabilize the country, uh, prevent further escalations, uh, or at least stop those escalations that occurred. Now, what I find fascinating, um, well, maybe not fascinating, uh, but at least interesting, uh, is that um, in recent years, both the EU and, and, and NATO published uh, documents from which we grasp that their understanding of their own problems and their own uh, uh, shortfalls in the management of the Libyan crisis um, are to be attributed to uh, member states' divisions. Uh, consequently, the EU and NATO uh, envisaged institutional reforms uh, that aim at creating or uh, establishing or forming ad hoc coalitions of the willing within those, those organizations to speed up uh, action or to bypass the veto power of individual member states. Um, indeed, we, 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 did, we did see very serious uh, divisions among the European Union member states, uh, uh, especially France and Italy, um, and also between two NATO member states, uh, namely uh, France and Turkey, uh, over the Libyan dossier. In the latter case, you, you might remember that uh, uh, Turkish and French vessels uh, came closer to a military confrontation in the summer of 2020 over the issue of implementing the, um, the UN arms embargo uh, in Libya. And yet, uh, this idea that, uh, that promoting collisions of the willing can be a silver bullet uh, may be another example of the organizations learning the wrong lessons. Uh, because as I said, you know, the partial mobilization of NATO for the 2011 operation um, and the fact that NATO operated as de facto as a coalition of the willing uh, during that campaign um, was a key problem, were a key problems in, in, in the management of the Libyan crisis. Um, and I also tend to dispute the idea that EU or, or NATO crisis management can be understood only or mainly against the uh, yardstick of member states' interests uh, or the divisions among the member states are the only problem here. Um, they are part of the problem, uh, but in the book I, I pose greater attention to the role of institutions themselves in shaping uh, EU and NATO policies and on the impact of operational cultures and instruments. Um, for example, in the case of the European Union, uh, well, the European Union was in fact united on a number of occasions uh, in, in, in Libya. Uh, the EU is the international organization that launched um, the highest number of initiatives in Libya uh, after 2011, uh, including one CSDP mission, UBAM Libya, and two CSDP operations, uh, Sofia and Irene. Uh, results uh, were poor, uh, if not pathetic, uh, uh, and I argue that this was the case because the EU and also NATO, um, what they have been facing since 2011 uh, is a strategy problem rather than merely an institutional one. Uh, the main strategy problem that these organizations had in Libya was how and why to use hard power in a fast changing crisis like the Libyan how to address local, local spoilers of the Libyan political dialogue uh, and international spoilers as, as well uh, and, the, and their own hybrid tactics. Um, now, the, the first component of this uh, strategy problem uh, common to both the EU and NATO is the uh, lack of knowledge of the host country uh, or the operational theater in the case of the 2011 operation, the Joint Operations Area, the GOA, 
as, as according to NATO language. Um, a second problem identified in, in the book is, is more political in culture, actually. Um, and it is the, uh, it, it's, a, it's a legitimacy issue. Uh, it's, it's, it's about when, uh, when to intervene, especially with hard power. And in the case of the European Union, uh, a difficulty in articulating uh, and conceptualizing uh, the utility of hard power in world politics more, more broadly. Um, now, the uh, a brief focus on, on those two aspects. So the, the, the lack of knowledge uh, includes some basic intelligence gaps uh, on Libya's human terrain, uh, for example, and even geography, in fact, because NATO uh, lacked updated maps of, of Libya during the 2011, uh, 2011 operation, during uh, Operation Unified Protector. Um, there was a serious misunderstanding uh, of the 2011 conflict in Libya, which was too hastily labeled a revolution against a tyrant or an autocrat, um, but which in fact was a civil war. Um, and I also prefer the term uprisings, plural, uprisings, um, to the term revolution, uh, because the term revolution, especially if put in the context of the, of the Arab Spring, of the so-called Arab Spring, exaggerated the Western view and interpretation of the of events in Libya uh, and of the anti gaddafi movement as being united as a united movement and a democratic movement. Uh, it was so many things uh, and different things that this was a, 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 a noble simplification. Uh, there was also a lack of institutional intelligence, uh, especially uh, on the part of the European Union in this case. Um, for example, the EU's uh, 2012 uh, strategy paper on Libya encompassed a number of assistance programs uh, but assistance program, uh, programs was not what Libya needed. Uh, I mean, they were fair enough in the short term, but, but in the longer term, uh, what Libya needed was economic institution building. Um, you know, reforming the corrupt and partisan economic institutions of Libya, which were used to, uh, as resource allocators uh, to buy off uh, and co-opt specific uh, social or tribal segments of the Libyan people. Um, they were using that fashion in that, in that fashion since Idris, really, since the monarchy. Uh, and even more so uh, under Gaddafi. And after Gaddafi, they became uh, a, a channel uh, for militia uh, financing. Um, the EU also failed to understand uh, that Libya uh, didn't have an institutional and tactical capacity to absorb EU financial programs. Uh, so a significant portion of what was promised uh, was never delivered. Um, so we can speak of a, a mix of hubris and ignorance uh, here. Um, then on the legitimacy issue, uh, the legitimacy issue has a twofold um, uh, component. Uh, on the one hand, the desire by both NATO and the European Union to operate under a UN resolution, a UN Security Council resolution, or at least following the local ownership principle, and if possible, both uh, things combined. Uh, so following uh, a UN Security Council resolution and a Libyan invitation, an invitation of the Libyan government. Now on paper, these are very good principles, uh, but in reality, both turned out to be problematic in Libya. And, and, and this is possibly, and I understand this, but this is possibly the most uncomfortable finding of, of my book. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, the UN Security Council uh, is paralyzed by actors, uh, especially Russia, but uh, more recently and increasingly China too, uh, who grasped the possibility to impede you or NATO action in Libya, uh, or to defuse it uh, by setting impossible mandates for Western-led uh, operations. Uh, a clear example of this is the mandate for EU Operation Irini, uh, adopting the principle of compliance boarding uh, to conduct inspections on vessels uh, suspected uh, of, of transporting arms into, into Libya. Uh, so it's, it, it is enough for a, for a vessel to refuse uh, inspection to just continue uh, on, it, on its way um, undeterred uh, and uh, undetached. Um, the, um, uh, the other problem is the, with the principle of a local ownership. Uh, and that's of course a very sensitive problem. Um, but that, that, that principle also turned out to, to be uh, problematic in the Libyan crisis management. Uh, because you know, uh, it's, um, it's quite difficult to elaborate a strategy based on, um, on local ownership where the local owner is in fact a uh, fragmented puzzle uh, or enjoys uh, limited legitimacy domestically 
or uh, has legitimacy but has very limited power on the ground. Um, and perhaps, uh, perhaps the most disturbing part of this, uh, of this um, reflection is that the principle of local ownership was itself weaponized by some uh, Libyan factions, um, possibly instigated by, uh, by their foreign patrons, uh, in order to maintain a zero-sum game uh, from which those factions uh, were profiting, but most Libyans suffered. Um, so this is a key problem, I think, in, in, in that the both NATO and the EU uh, and their member states need to address. Um, but that requires adopting a more political role, um, whereas the, uh, the, the, the EU and NATO uh, have so far, so far tried and, and tended to operate merrily or mainly through um, technical tools. And finally, uh, the need for, for hard power. Um, the Libyan crisis has uh, many different strands, uh, but this book shows that security is key, really. Um, the, there is an ongoing debate about this, uh, which resembles the kitchen and, 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 and the chicken and the egg, and the egg thing. You know, uh, should we prioritize uh, political uh, or military or economic or social aspects? Uh, which aspect is the more important? Um, and so on. Um, my book uh, confirmed the findings uh, made by Wolfgang in a 2017 article uh, that a certain level of security is a precondition for successful uh, economic and, um, uh, and political developments. So uh, controversial as it might be and, in, and as, as it might sound, when you talk about security, we need to talk about hard power. And uh, at least among ourselves, uh, we, we can be candid about it and, and, and not need be afraid of the word. Um, NATO in particular, I think, needs to conceptualize how to face hybrid threats in a scenario characterized by a legitimacy void. Because many future crises in the broader MENA region, and uh, possibly Central Africa as well, are likely to resemble the Libyan crisis in the fragmentation of the, uh, both the political landscape and, uh, in, and in, in the legitimacy void. Uh, so just what do you do if you want to have a role in, in, a, in a scenario where you need to deter or defeat hybrid threats emerging from that scenario, but where you can't simply train a partner because you might have no reliable partner to train? Uh, and, uh, and the EU, well, the EU really, I think, needs to learn to use hard power to uphold its normative nature uh, or the norms uh, it, it champions. Um, hard power is not necessarily military power. Let me stress that uh, as well. Uh, it can also be sanctions. Uh, but again, the EU failed badly to use those um, in, in Libya as well. Um, so by dismissing the use, or at least the threat of a kinetic force uh, against the spoilers of the Libyan political dialogue, uh, and also by using sanctions uh, inconsistently, the EU delivered a message uh, to Libyan and international players alike that uh, unilateralism, unilateralism in open violation of UN resolutions could be pursued with impunity in Libya. Uh, so this is a classic uh, example of a situation uh, where, uh, you know, uh, failing to act assertively when necessary uh, aggravated um, the crisis. Um, the, the result was greater suffering for the Libyan people. And I, I don't consider that a normative policy or a normative uh, outcome, uh, quite frankly. Uh, I call it an unjust policy and an unjust, a profoundly unjust uh, outcome. Um, so with that, uh, I would uh, leave the floor uh, to your uh, comments. Thank you, Stefano. That was a, a very, very uh, precise uh, summary of a very detailed uh, book full of uh, events, analysis, and I think you did a very good job, and I'm looking forward to hearing commentary from our uh, panelists uh, here before we start uh, opening it up for questions. Um, we do have with us uh, Ambassador Jean Kretz, who was the ambassador, the U.S. ambassador to Libya on ground uh, on March of uh, 2011. Uh, Ambassador uh, Kretz is, is a very distinguished uh, uh, diplomat. Uh, he's been in many um, uh, positions uh, in Israel, Egypt, Syria, Pakistan, India, China. 
and uh, he was at one point the Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Near Eastern Affairs. Um, his uh, presence in Libya uh, in March of uh, 2011 uh, gives him the position of seeing from the inside and analyzing uh, minute by minute what happened. And uh, obviously thereafter, um, he was uh, followed by uh, our late ambassador, uh, uh, Chris Stevens. And, uh, and I'm pretty sure that uh, through your whole career and track and follow up of what has been happening in the Middle East and particularly in Libya, you have a very clear perspective as to where we are right now and where we're heading and you've read the book so we, we're looking forward to your commentary on it ambassador Fritz, please thank you uh you, you'll note in the in the comments that i'll try to make over a very quick five to whatever minutes that um there is a lot of agreement with what dr marcusi um, has stated before although we differ in some aspects let me start by saying by putting it in context that un until my arrival in uh, Libya in December of 2008, there had been no ambassadorial representation or no embassy in Libya for 36 years. So obviously uh, there was a lack of familiarity on the part of the American government with what was happening uh, in Libya across the broad spectrum. Uh, from 2008 to 2010, I had an excellent embassy staff. We were able to um, assess the Libyan political scene uh, regarding Gaddafi, Gaddafi's family, the military, differences among the regions. However, we barely scratched the surface of tribal dynamics, which of course uh, proved to be critical in understanding what occurred prior to the revolution, during the revolution, and obviously in the years following. Just part of that reason that we were able to, um, I'll use the word penetrate, in an, uh, an overt um, intelligence, not covert, was that there had been several thousand Libyans who had studied in the United States. And when we you know, were, were allowed to um, pursue diplomatic activities again in Libya, they were just anxious to talk to us. They wanted to tell us what was happening in the country uh, and to help, us under, to help us understand. When the uprising broke out um, in February, I was in Washington because I had been forced to leave because of uh, WikiLeaks. Um, but I was then uh, asked to, to kind of um, participate in the Washington deliberations over the next several months on an interagency basis. There was tremendous reluctance, as you know, in the US administration to get involved. I think there was um, among the officials at high levels, there was obviously an acceptance of the doctrine responsibility to protect. But at the same time, there was a question, the US cannot be everywhere to intervene in instances where a dictator or a, a bad leader committed acts against his people. Um, I was asked by Secretary Clinton to go to Rome and to Cairo at the end of February to, um, to meet with um, members of the National Transitional Council and others from Libya who had sent a delegation to meet me in Cairo. Uh, my discussions with them and what they had told me about what they were doing in the beginning of the uh, revolution convinced me that this was really a national uprising uh, and that it was not as Gaddafi and um, his uh, people were trying to convince everybody a uh, radical Islamist um, uprising, you know, uh, started in Darna, Darna and uh, continued uh, in that path, that it truly was, in fact, a, a, a national uprising. Um, the, what finally, I think, turned the U.S. position were two things. Number one, uh, Secretary Clinton's meeting with uh, the late Mahmoud Jabril in Paris, a few days before the UN resolution and a, uh, a, a conversation among various of, uh, of us with the, the president and the National Security Council um, saying that the threat of the humanitarian disaster that was about to take place in Benghazi was real and that we needed to take Gaddafi at his word when he said, 
we'll flush them out like rats or whatever that expression was, because he had made threats in the past and we knew that he was capable of carrying out, you know, uh, atrocities, obviously in prison, the murder of and the hanging of students uh, in Benghazi several years before. But at the same time, uh, regime change was not an issue that was actively discussed or pursued uh, in U.S. government uh, circles. The, uh, the, the goal basically was to provide a level playing field so that those who were fighting uh, Gaddafi's army uh, would not be threatened uh, from the air. Um, and that as time went on, of course, uh, it was the view, I think, of the uh, National Transitional Council that Gaddafi had to go. Uh, and um, although we didn't do anything actively to pursue that, we, we accepted, at least implicitly, that Gaddafi would probably not be there uh, at the end of this process. Um, when Tripoli fell in August and after the death of Gaddafi in October, uh, the new government was absolutely immersed 24 hours, seven days a week in dealing with the injured, injured Thuar, the, the revolutionaries. They were, um, they had paid the price for the revolution and they wanted their due in terms of being taken care of. And uh, day after day after day, the resources of the government were focused on that particular issue and that went on for several months. I, I found that um, in assessing what happened uh, in the aftermath of the revolution, that there was tremendous par paralysis on the part of the initial government with uh, Prime Minister al Um for several reasons. Number one, there was a real fear to, um, to reinvigorate the, uh, the economic sector, especially the infrastructure because that there, were, there was such sensitivity to the fact that people would be looking for corruption, fraud, embezzlement. So that those who were involved in the economic uh, field didn't want to spend money, quote unquote, because they were really terrified that they would be accused of some kind of embezzlement. Even in the question of trying to build up a, a, a counterintelligence uh, ca capacity uh, to counter uh, what was a, a terrorist threat, uh, emanating inside and outside of Libya, uh, there was fear that anything resembling, even though it had the best of intentions uh, to produce a counterintelligence uh, structure, there was fear that it would be seen as just a simple return of the old Mohabarat. And so people were not willing to engage in that kind of dialogue. Um, there was as much, you know, the, 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 the driving, uh, the, you could feel the heat among the Libyan population that starting with the end of, uh, with the death of Gaddafi, they wanted that vote. They wanted to, to stand in line and vote for a new government and there was nothing that was gonna stop them. And I think that was accepted as, uh, you know, an absolute need uh, of the government uh, to make that happen. But in fact, uh, we didn't see any real Quote unquote, quote unquote, preparation at the grassroots level, uh, you know, to make that vote, um, you know, uh, or, to, or to produce an informative, uh, popu informed population. Uh, and finally, um, very difficult, very difficult to bring the tribes, as the, Dr. Marcuse said, to bring them in to join any kind of federal authority or to give up those weapons uh, that they had finally been able to brandish after so many years uh, underground under Gaddafi. So at the end of the day, even if, and again, as Dr. Marcuse said, the international community wanted to invest heavily uh, in Libya, there was no structure. I mean, let's face it, the government that Gaddafi ruled over was in fact a Potemkin village um, with no structures. And when, when he left, it basically collapsed. So even if we were willing uh, to, to, you know, to, uh, to invest lots of money, there was no real uh, capacity uh, to absorb it. Um, in, looking out, in looking at some of the, the lessons, number one, again, as the doctor said, 
we needed we need to have knowledge of the country in which we are dealing. Had we had a better understanding, I think, of of what the tribes wanted uh, in the aftermath of the revolution, I think we could have offered better solutions. Number two, again, the question of security. Had that been dealt with immediately, uh, had we been able uh, as an international community to provide the kind of security that the, the government needed in the aftermath, that may have had a big difference. If you recall, whenever there was a, a tribal uh, dispute that broke out or a problem in one part of the country, Prime Minister al had to get in a helicopter and fly there to solve the problem. That, that was no way uh, to deal with the, the immense security uh, problems that Libya faced. Uh, and finally, um, we, uh, in, in dealing with this kind of issue, especially in Libya, had there been transparent mechanisms to convince the population um, you know, that uh, they could be reassured that this was not the old regime and that in fact there were people willing to, to work for a new Libya and that fraud and corruption would not be the characteristic of this government, uh, perhaps we could have made um, some progress uh, at will. With respect to the United States, of course, September 11th, 2012, when Chris Stevens was murdered uh, in Benghazi, um, the US, which really didn't have tremendous amount of interest in investing in Libya in the aftermath of, of the revolution, uh, basically uh, withdrew to a certain extent um, from that effort. Thank Sorry. you, Ambassador. That was uh, a very, very uh, detailed uh, analysis of uh, your perspective on what happened. Uh, it is true and since 1972, from 1972 until 2008, I think, uh, there was no ambassador of the United States in Libya. So it, from 2003, 2004, I recall Greg Barry, who was a charge of affair there at that time, and uh, it was just the beginning of uh, formulating a, a base of uh, diplomats in, uh, in, in, uh, in Tripoli. Um, uh, there's much to be said about uh, US involvement uh, from 2011 until 2022. Uh, in many ways, and the book references this as well, uh, there has been a, a sort of a reliance on the European allies to to lead, uh, if you will, uh, the process, the recommendations and so on. They were mostly coming in from Europe uh, and uh, the United States had taken a sort of a back seat on this, probably as, a, as it relates to the uh, assassination of Ambassador Stevens. But that again is uh, an area that is worth exploring a little bit more. The US leadership uh, front or back seat and. Uh, Again, this is something we should get back to. Um, I'm actually very honored to uh, have with us uh, a very uh, decorated and distinguished um, uh, individual, uh, Major uh, General retired uh, Rob Wayhill, who has been in the uh, thick of NATO action uh, when uh, the uh, uh, in, in, in not invasion, but when NATO interfered um, in Libya for the purpose initially of protecting Benghazi. Um, a very decorated uh, military um, officer, uh, a, a, a long, long history in the UK um, uh, military. Uh, he is, um, uh, I mean, I look at his CV and it's pretty impressive. His uh, last position was executive director in policy, strategy, and plans with NATO. He was based in Naples uh, when NATO decided to interfere in, uh, in uh, Libya. Uh, he is uh, highly decorated. Uh, he is uh, basically uh, uh, sort of loaded with honors and awards, including the NATO Meritorious Service Medal that was given to him in 2012, and a commander of the order uh, of uh, the British Empire in May, March of 2012 as well, and the US Legion of Merit by the uh, multinational force um, in Iraq in 2007. His track record goes back to involvement of NATO. He was the COO 
in Kosovo, based in Germany in Kosovo. Uh, and uh, he had written an incredibly impressive book called The uh, Calderon, uh, and describes in detail NATO's campaign in Libya. So without further introduction, um, I would like to ask him to make comments on the book and on the occasion of 10 years after he led in many ways the uh, 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 NATO action in Libya. Uh, Thank you. Hello? Yeah, can you hear me okay? Yeah, I can hear you. So a couple, a couple of points really. First is to say um, I'm intrigued by the notion of interference uh, in Libya. Um, so that, that's an interesting one. I hadn't heard that before, but I'm, I'm pretty sure it was 11 years ago as well, because my, my timeline tells me um, that it was, I think, the 17th of March. It was 11, 11 years ago. Correct. 11, yeah, 17th of March, 11 years ago, UNSCR 1973 uh, was approved in the, uh, in the council, uh, which gave us the legal foundation for the interference or the intervention. Um, and um, it was the 19th. So, you know, tomorrow, 11 years ago, that... Uh, um, that uh, Odyssey Dawn uh, commenced, uh, which was the coalition air campaign principally, uh, although there was maritime elements to it as well. So, I mean, I, I just uh, want to congratulate Stefano for, a, for a, uh, an amazing um, accrual of data and analysis to produce the book that you have. Uh, there are elements with which I profoundly agree. Uh, there's elements of which I profoundly disagree. Uh, but then I will tell you, um, having uh, published um, the cauldron, there were plenty of people who thought that uh, most of what uh, was written in there was, was far too biased and partisan uh, to, to be, uh, lay any claim at all of an objective insight into the way that uh, NATO um, intervened um, in Libya in 2011. But what I, what I thought I'd do is kind of give you, so I'm, I'm talking really, you know, uh, as you'd expect from a, from a military uh, perspective, and, and I'm going to sort of pull out four big themes, if you like. One is um, speed of response, uh, strategic communications, responsibility to protect and responsibility whilst protecting, um, and strategic end state, uh, some of which has been, has been touched on. Um, and kicking off with the, the speed of response, um, I mean, it is, it is a fact that, that NATO was completely wrong-footed and wholly unprepared uh, for the task that was laid bare um, at the end of February, uh, beginning of March uh, 2011. Uh, we in Naples uh, were watching with interest, uh, considering it was part of our area of interest to a degree responsibility as well of what was happening uh, in North Africa, but had no indication whatsoever uh, that an intervention was pending and that if it was, it was almost inconceivable that NATO would have the wherewithal politically, um, militarily, uh, to unify nations to be able to respond in a manner that was going to be required uh, by the international community. So we were uh, on arms reversed at the end of February, beginning of um, uh, March 2011, unbeknown to us that headquarters NATO um, and Supreme Headquarters, headquarters Allied Powers Europe had already made a decision that, that uh, NATO might have a part uh, to play. And it wasn't until the 3rd or 4th of March that, that, that we were informed uh, by the North Atlantic Council uh, that we uh, needed to prepare the planning. Uh, so a maritime embargo, uh, a variety of uh, no-fly zones, um, uh, and a humanitarian uh, mission in preparation for potential operations uh, in Libya. Even though uh, in that first week of March, it was, it was impossible to imagine uh, that all of the uh, grand strategic, strategic, political and uh, uh, military planets would align sufficient for us to undertake uh, a task of this nature. And um, so not only were we wholly uh, prepared, but as we went through March and it dawned on us that we might actually uh, play a fundamental role. The whole, the whole business of aligning nations uh, to a common goal, which was rooted in responsibility to protect either notion um, of protection of civilians, uh, was extremely difficult. Uh, we were planning simultaneously uh, with uh, four separate plans, two no-fly zone equivalents, 
um, a humanitarian and a maritime embargo. We had, uh, I had a core team of 15 that was reinforced by about 100 or so uh, military officers from all parts of NATO and different services to undertake this planning, which is very difficult. Uh, most of whom had never done operational level planning before. At the same time as the planning, we were attempting to determine what forces were required in order to achieve uh, the prescribed objectives at the sort of the military and, and the strategic uh, level. Um, and we, we were watching as the coalition led by the US on USS Mount Whitney, 25 miles off the coast of Italy, was preparing to undertake a, a, an intervention um, once the UNSCR 1973 had been signed. And that was the point uh, after French participation, British and American uh, decision to, to put NATO into the fray, the sudden realisation we were on. Um, and uh, so we finished the planning, uh, North Atlantic Council approved the uh, appropriate uh, plans for a no-fly zone to protect civilians. Can you hear me okay? Because I've got an unstable internet connection, I've been told, if you can. Um, and, uh, and then off we went. Uh, and so, so speed of response, planning, uh, what is described perhaps unfortunately by some as the Hail Mary pass from coalition to NATO, which led then to NATO uh, assuming command of the operation uh, at the end of March. Um, it was ugly, really, really ugly. Um, and, uh, and if there was a big lesson learned uh, in that short period, it was uh, that you cannot assume uh, that, a, that a handoff from a coalition to NATO um, that is sort of narrow band coalition into multinational, um, uh, a multinational intervention is going to be anything other than extremely, extremely complex. My second point is on strategic communications. As we went through the planning, a number of key constraints were placed on us. For example, um, we were told there would be zero civilian casualties. What did that mean? That meant that we, if there was an expectation of civilian casualties, either being killed or injured, we could not strike the target. Every, every, therefore, rooted in the way that we were undertaking our role was the notion of the protection of civilians. This was contrary to some national and international uh, strategic communication narratives, which were regime change. Now, some nations were openly declared in terms of regime change. Some of it was more subliminal. But, but we were quite clear uh, that, that we were not chasing Gaddafi. We were not chasing Gaddafi's acolytes. We were protecting civilians. And not, not known to many, except perhaps those that might have had to plough through three or 400 odd pages of the book, was known that two thirds of our, our targeting database was not, was not used because of the threat to civilian casualties. So we had to be very careful in terms of the intelligence gathering, the timeliness and accuracy and the way that we targeted and undertook the missions related, uh, related to um, the targeting. But it, but it was contrary, the notion of protection of civilians to some of those strategic messages. And how difficult is it to be running an operation in which you're quite clear about what the strategic aim is rooted in UNSCR 1973, which was the responsibility to protect. And every single mission that was being flown across the Mediterranean um, or from the Mediterranean uh, into Libya was rooted in this notion of protection of civilians. Very difficult. Um, and I mean, Charlie Bouchard, who was the commander, said if he heard anybody talking about regime change in the headquarters, they were booted out of the headquarters. Uh, that was not our game but a contrary uh, narrative uh, notwithstanding. Responsibility uh, to, to protect, going back to what I was, what I was saying, uh, when you've got a mandate, which is zero um, civilian casualties, uh, in which collateral damage estimation is incredibly, is incredibly low, in which the, as was described by, by Jean, the, our understanding, let alone intelligence gathering, let alone the analysis of intelligence to, to, to produce um, actionable uh, targeting was virtually zero at the beginning of this, uh, beginning of this operation. So the notion that, that, that we were told, oh, by the way, you, you can't harm civilians, you've got to protect civilians, you've got to have low collateral damage, 
it virtually no collateral damage if possible. So no bridges, no buildings, you know, avoid, avoid destruction of the infrastructure left us in a perilous position, not least also made worse by the appalling weather uh, in North Africa, particularly Libya in March and April. Uh, there, there were snow, uh, sandstorms, et cetera, et cetera. And then to cap it all, and we hadn't calculated this in our assessment, um, Mount Etna was spewing ash into the atmosphere, which meant aeroplanes had to, had to bypass uh, Sicily on a roundabout route uh, in order to be able to go uh, and cover uh, the targeting requirements in, in uh, northern Libya. So uh, whilst we understood and we implemented responsibility to protect, responsibility whilst protecting uh, was tricky. Uh, and uh, there are plenty of examples uh, where uh, we did not strike targets for fear of civilian casualties um, and where we had to uh, we had to uh, beg, borrow and steal platforms and capabilities in order to increase our confidence that we weren't going to hurt civilians. I'll just finish off uh, with, with a point that was made by Stefano, which is about the strategic end state, which I will, I will quote, and it arrived um, in, in Naples um, fairly early on in the planning. And, and in, in, in essence, it set the context for failure, uh, in my view, a strategic failure there are, which was the end state, and we argued against this. Measures agreed by the North Atlantic Council to protect civilians under the threat of attack in Libya, in accordance with UNSCR 1973, are no longer required. What does that tell us? Well, once we'd finished protecting civilians, that's it, guys. We can all pack our bags and go home. Big mistake. So on the 30th of October, when the last AWACS cruised out of Libyan airspace, and I'm stood there with Charlie Bouchard and a small team, turning all the lights off in the, in the operations room that we'd, we'd been servicing this operation uh, for the best part of, of eight months. We all looked at each other, watched this space. We had calculated, we had pushed and shoved SHAPE and the North Atlantic Council to consider the post-conflict restoration uh, and, and recovery. Uh, and I, I don't actually, uh, maybe contrary to Stefano's um, thesis, I don't lay the blame at um, NATO on this one. NATO's responsibility to protect security, stability, fine. But actually, the political aftermath was the responsibility of the international community. That's where the failure lay. Um, and, and NATO was pushing hard. We did a lot of planning for post-conflict um, uh, and post-conflict analysis, and it just went nowhere. Uh, regrettably, and, there, and therefore it was a self-fulfilling pro prophecy that by the end of 2011 and certainly in 2012, uh, we would see internal conflict and strife break out. So that's a kind of short, sharp gallop around what is normally a, a, a two or three hour discussion. Happy to stop there. That, that is a fantastic analysis. And it's, you're, you're throwing it back to the European Union. You're saying, here it is, guys. It's your responsibility. We did our job there and the aftermath is yours. And that is um, worth a rich conversation after. Uh, thank you, Rob. Um, we are um, a little bit short of time. We want to be a little bit more efficient. Uh, we do have with us um, our uh, former ambassador of Libya to the European Union, uh, Farida Adagi. Farida is very well known in Libya for uh, her uh, citizens' diplomacy, activism, philanthropy. Um, she was... Um, uh, for many, many years uh, living in the, um, uh, in the United States uh, uh, with many of us in the diaspora who were opposing Gaddafi. Um, Farida is, uh, uh, is very well spoken. She had spent uh, her life um, in, on issues related to child education and uh, worked in uh, different capacities with the United Nations uh, addressing um, development programs in the Middle East and North Africa. And uh, then she was the ambassador, as I mentioned, to the European Union. So she's had a very close view as to how Europeans uh, uh, acted, analyzed, and, um, and were involved in Libya over the last 11 years. It's not 10 years, you are correct, Rob. So without any further introduction, Farida, Farida is also on our advisory board with the National Council on U.S. Libya Relations. Uh, please go ahead, Farida. We'd like to hear your uh, comments on the book and the last 11 years of European and NATO uh, involvement in Libya. 
Thank you very much, uh, Hani. Thank you for inviting me to contribute to this very interesting uh, discussion. Congratulations, Stefano. Excellent book. I was reading it over the last three years. And while I was finishing uh, each part, I was saying, yes, yes. I, was, I, wit I lived and witnessed many, many of the arguments that you have said. I find it a very, uh, uh, I find it quite um, gutsy, objective, and uh, analytical. And I counted, you have 40 or 45 pages of references. My goodness, so many uh, scholars, uh, articles, books, uh, interviews uh, that you have been really uh, undergoing and uh, that. Uh, included in this uh, uh, book, very inter important book. And uh, I, I hope that this definitely that this book should be translated in Arabic. We have to follow up how to spread it. It might, I will talk to you later because it's a very important book. I think that we have to present it to the Libyan audience, to the universities, to the scholars, to the researchers, to the media, I think many people would like to know. I learned a lot, many, many information that you have uh, in this book. I, I, I didn't knew about them. And uh, just to indicate that uh, I was a chargé d'affaires from January 2015, and I resigned in June 2016. I couldn't swallow. I couldn't spend my time. I couldn't continue to represent uh, a government that uh, uh, I, I, I realized later on, not that I realized later on, I did my very best really to represent my country and not a government because I have been in the opposition for so many years. So when I was monitoring the corruption and the lack of interest and the follow up, and I have to confess, though, however, that I was really literally given a green light by the uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs, uh, Dr. Dairy, who really supported me, but I reached an, uh, uh, after, you know, uh, uh, spending uh, just a year and uh, maybe a few months in, in the European Union and in, in, in Brussels, I met with over 90 or uh, uh, 100 uh, persons in, in the Union and at, at the NATO. The first four or five months, I have been trying to listen, to interview, to talk, to discover the terrain within which I had to move. I knew the union, I've been cooperating with the union before that on my other capacity as a, a development strategist. But when I uh, accepted to, to, to come as a charge d'affaires, it was a political, it was also a humanitarian development uh, responsibility that I undertook. Unfortunately, I would understand and I have to confess that at the, at the beginning when NATO came, to really, quote unquote, liberate Libya, as few people want, tend to say, there was uh, uh, an agreement by many Libyans who have been really suffering during the regime. However, today I will conclude my remarks of what on, on revisiting the bombing, revisiting the NATO. Uh, so uh, I, I uh, uh, after I after I had been attending all these meetings and committees and conferences and flying from place to place, I, I realized that I started to really find out what you have correctly said, Stefano. I, there, is no, there was no strategy. I kept asking, what's, what's the strategy? What do you want from Libya? What do you want to be following up in Libya? And then there was no lack of sharing of information. I would wake up in the morning, I opened the, the magazine or the uh, newspaper and I find so many decisions on Libya that I am there like, a, you know, I don't exist. Nobody, you know, uh, talked or explained or, uh, but it was very lack of sharing of information. And what really has been upsetting me coming from an activist background, of course, there was so much competition between member states. There was, when I meet privately with each ambassador, they will be talking to me different from what they talk when they are in, in, in the formal meetings. There was competition, as you have mentioned in the, in the book and you have mentioned now in your brief. It started with, of course, the, the French and the Italian, then it extended to the different uh, 
regional uh, players and uh, it, it went on and on and and I think uh, 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 the, uh, it developed and then what what also I couldn't you know continue to accept I, I started to witness how many European government and the Americans at one point as well started taking sides and then of course, Everybody interfered in Libya and so many conferences, so many dialogues, so many roadmaps to the point where I'm telling them that all the roads are lost now. We have to stop having roadmaps because I think there are no roads and there are no maps after all the failure of where, of where we are today. So I think this, this uh, I, I went also, I, I was interested not only to, to, uh, to meet and to listen, to the ambassador and to the uh, uh, um, employees at the European Union or at the NATO. I was very interested to go and visit to the uh, civil society, to the university, to the academic, how they were seen. Libya was not very, very much really on, the, on, on their mind. Libya was not, Libya, Libya was Gaddafi for them. And as many of you know, I mean, uh, when I was in the opposition, I was going to the uh, European Union to speak about you know human rights and democracy and all this uh, uh, warning and nobody would uh, even accept to meet with us when we were going to because they went to bed with Gaddafi they sold arms to Gaddafi they supported him but so the relationship was you know we wouldn't say that uh, oh, we are revisiting today this whole concept of human rights and democracy I have been fighting I have been spending my life uh, fighting for this principle and they will continue to do. But again, we have to revisit all of this because there is really, we need, uh, I think, uh, after where we are today, after 11 years where we are today, that's where I think, uh, Stefano, you have really uh, been digging to the roots why we are where we are. Why we are after all, all these uh, uh, efforts that I wouldn't deny some of them were done in good intention, I needed to, I need, we needed the help of uh, uh, the outside forces. We needed the help of other governments. But unfortunately, today, all Libyans would say, please leave us alone. Either we solve our problems or let us, you know, continue in this very ugly reality that we are uh, uh, going through. And the sanctions, the, the joke of the sanctions. I've spent like one year hearing about the sanctions, implementing the sanctions, and the sanctions have been implemented for one or two or three uh, Libyan political officials after they left. And of course, what, what led me also to resign at the end is really witnessing the hypocrisy with the different players in Libya, with the different politicians in Libya who are corrupt, who are really working for their own interests, who are really, who led, because we cannot only blame the EU or the NATO, but we have to blame ourselves as well. Unfortunately, many of the uh, Libyans themselves have accumulated because the vacuum, the vacuum that was really left, uh, uh, so to speak, not dealt with, have increased the intervention of the wrong Libyans. And if I have to blame today the EU in particular and UN Smil as well, okay, is that they are really listening or uh, 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 closing themselves. They are, they are uh, 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 controlled, I wouldn't say controlled, but their circles with whom they are talking, unfortunately, are again, with maybe I wouldn't say the majority, but you know, many of them are not their genuine Libyan, either those who want to be ministers or who want to be ambassadors or who want to have a business or who want to have their self-interest. But if Libyans who are uh, real genuine Libyans who are really talking from their heart to protect, because at the end of the day, we, when we talk about all of these issues, for me, I, yes, I'm involved in politics, but all my life I'm involved with the people at the end of the day. For me to see our people suffering for 11 years, we cannot, uh, you know, and, and, and then Libya became like a laboratory. President Obama said that my biggest uh, mistake in my presidency to pack and to leave Libya. How? 
how you pack and leave Libya after knowing 42 years a country living under you know the the the, the Gaddafi regime, and how and and also now we heard our friend from NATO and I think also the yes you you needed to uh, 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 prevent and protect, but you had also I think the responsibility of not at least you know. Uh, working closely in uniting the army, in training. In... So it's the combination of so many, uh, uh, unfortunately, big mistakes that led to a very, very, nobody on earth today can uh, forecast what's coming up from Libya. Libya is under a volcano again. There is so much anger. There is no, I mean, sorry to say, it, but I have to say it. When a government like the Raj government, the internationally recognized government, it shouldn't be the internationally recognized government, it should be a nationally recognized government. The, 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 the whole process with UN men, six or seven or eight UN representatives, yes, many of them were genuine, they have done their best, they're trying to do their best, but I'm sorry to say, so much confusion, so much competition. And we can no longer afford to co keep committing mistakes after mistakes after mistakes. Because who is learning from these mistakes? Who is changing them? And we are waiting that you and Smil or the EU will come out and say, this is where we have made mistakes. Nobody wants to commit what, what are the mistakes. They are always uh, uh, protecting uh, their, their role in, in, in Libya. Okay. So unfortunately today, you know, uh, 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 when we listen to the Libyan people, what the Libyan needs, like you have said, uh, Stefano and the, the previous speaker, what the Libyan needs is security as the first priority. Without security, we are not got, getting anywhere, forget it. No, all these tracks of political dialogue, political di dialogue, so many conferences, the economic track, how you can have all of this political dialogue and economic track and any other tracks when you have no security, when the militias are really getting uh, richer and richer, where, where the, the country is into so many different, uh, very alarming uh, groups. Then the people, of course, today, they want elections. No matter what we say about election, uh, Ambassador Chris, you have indicated that the, maybe the, you know, the experience of the, the Libyan uh, in their first election. And I recall very well that, you know, because I have been, I, I lived 40 years outside of Libya. I never thought I would go back uh, before I die. And when I went to Libya and attended the first election, I always repeat uh, I, uh, uh, this fantastic mo moment that made me really cry. I saw an ambulance coming and then uh, an elderly woman and her husband coming out of this ambulance and they were helped to walk to go into the room to elect. And they say, now we can die. We have the opportunity to really elect. Yes, there were problems, there were mistakes, but it was amazing that after 42 years, the lines of particularly many women, many, many, many women to, to, to go through election. So no problem, let us have elections, even if we commit some mistakes, but we need to get rid of all these uh, present, uh, institutions that are really leading us to 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 disasters to to uh, a very dangerous Frida. future. Thank you, Farida. One word. I have to be to, to do this uh, to say this, uh, uh, Hani, if I may, please. Definitely, we need to fight corruption. It is beyond imagination. We cannot re-elect prime minister and minister and government official, and they are all with no exception, we are very, very, very corrupt. And I do hope that definitely uh, 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 the Libyan, uh, uh, I'm, I, I'm proud, I'm proud to say that our people are not stopping, that the road is wrong, that the women and the civil society are playing a fantastic role, the, uh, despite the lack of uh, services, but people are really not stopping, continuing, hoping, hoping that really elections takes place. We need to prepare for election. We need to learn from our mistakes. We have brilliant brains of Libyans. I'm proud of them. And we are counting on the good countries that are really now humble enough 
to listen to the voice of the voiceless Libyans. Thank you very much for listening to me, and I'm sorry if I took a little no, bit no, over. not at all. Rita, you, uh, you said very important things today, and thank you very much. Uh, I am going to um, give the floor to uh, Arturo, Arturo Varvelli, who is the head of the Rome office and a senior policy fellow for the European Council on Foreign Affairs, or Foreign Relations, excuse me. He's uh, had extensive background of uh, research and interest in many geopolitical international affairs, uh, particularly in the Middle East and North Africa, and particularly in the European Union MENA relation. Uh, he has had many, many roles. He was the co-head of the MENA Center and head of the terrorism program at the Italian Institute for International Political Studies. He has had and wore so many head, hats. And uh, Arturo, I'm very curious to hear your opinion and your analysis on Stefano's book and the fact that this is the 11th uh, anniversary of the uh, uh, intervention in Libya. I'm not going to say the interference. Arturo, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you for the invitation, for the opportunity to speak here. So it's, it's very difficult to talk about, uh, about the, the EU in the Libyan crisis uh, of the last 11 years in, in only five minutes, but we will try. I would not, not like to repeat what Stefano Marcuzzi wrote in his book and say today, because I very much agree with the reconstruction of the role of the EU in the Libyan crisis over, over the, the past 11 years. So I don't want to do historical analysis, but focus a little more on the current, uh, on the current affairs. And uh, we, we, we can say in short that a unique position has rarely uh, been seen inside you in the last, in the last 11 years, no? Uh, at least before the Berlin conference, uh, there, there, there was, uh, certainly a long phase in which the two most active and influential players, European players, Italy and France, were on uh, opposing side, on, on opposing uh, position. We know it very well because uh, Italy uh, supported the uh, uh, Serrage government and on the other side, France uh, uh, supported uh, General After. I think it was a sort of zero-sum game, as as uh, Stefano as Stefano said. I don't think all the problems uh, are solved today, but uh, there have certainly been some improvements, uh, and the new position seems more solid overall. I think. Uh, I think the so-called Berlin process represents a, par a partial game changer on this, because these this diplomatic initiatives concluded by a conference organized in January 2020 by, by the German uh, uh, Chancellor uh, Angela, Angela Merkel, uh, which gathered a representative from, from all the states more, more, most involved, uh, was in some way very positive for the EU. Uh, because in a moment, that moment, when, uh, when Turkey and Russia were acquiring increasingly relevance uh, on the opposite side of the Libyan conundrum, the Berlin Conference managed to capitalize on a declared Russian-Turkish truce, whose actual breaking did not have any consequences on the holding of the conference. So the core original principle uh, of the Berlin com conference on the Berlin process, I think, was to build peace in Libya from the outside in. Uh, and it represents, in some way, a radical change from, from, from a different approach, the, the inside out approach, which had dominated peace negotiation until that moment. So, and on the European side, the Berlin Conference represents a sort of window of, op of opportunity for, for, for a more integrated uh, uh, approach, European appro approach, and, and for especially for three of the main uh, European actors, uh, Germany, Italy, and France. Um, to show that 
renewed diplomatic weight of Europe and, and to demonstrate the solid character of the, of the engagement, of their engagement in Libya. But to tell the truth, the conference of Berlin was not the first best for all the actors involved, but it was an important initiative for Europe to regain a centrality in the Libyan crisis management, you know, averting the, the major risk of leaving the conflict um, permanently in the hands of Turkey and, and, and Russia. No, why also at the same time avoiding the, the, the uh, spoiling European interest in a fundamental geopolitical scenario? No, I, I think I think. But then, then, then there, 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 were, there were at the time some some important mistakes, uh, and, and especially after the, the, the Berlin the Berlin process from from the EU, I think because. For example, we can talk about the, ele the election, uh, imposing a date of a, of, for the election. I think while setting a date for the election has been very helpful uh, to the UN in getting all political parties, political actors, Libyan political actors to agree to put down their arms and to get involved peacefully uh, in this kind of transitional phase. Um, limiting the, the roadmap to just that date could prove to be, I think, a, a, a mistake. Because since the establishment of a new transitional government chaired by, by, by uh, Dbeiba, uh, there has been little progress in, in the process of rebuilding the country. No? Because Libya, in Libya, I I'm, I'm, uh, totally agree with Farida, uh, Libya is currently a sort of Con such a consociative state, uh, we can talk, we, we, we can say, uh, in which corruption, dispersion of public funds, uh, I don't know, illicit trafficking, black economy uh, uh, remain particularly relevant. Uh, uh, and this very characteristic have probably helped contain the violence on one side, because each faction uh, has found fertile ground uh, to cultivate their own particular interest at the expense of the common good, but at the expense of the common good. And it is for this reason for me that uh, the, the current status, uh, the, the current status quo uh, most likely appeals to many Libya, Libyan faction. Uh, that uh, now fear dispection, fear uh, losing their control, losing their consolidated privilege after uh, the, 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 the potential election, the general election. So, uh, and this uh, transition after the Berlin process, I think, and the government, the Beba government, I think, uh, it seems for me another wasted opportunity on the part of you and its and its members, um, because because in particular these three countries, France, Germany, and Italy, have done too little to to start a more constructive path in Libya to help Libyans to 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 go to go higher, and. Um, now it seems to me that we are in a new in a new uh, in a new problem because we with the stalemate stalemate between Bashaga on one side and Beba uh, on the other, uh, with the possibility of a duplic of, of a new duplic duplication of institution, it it seems to me that is very difficult to 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 try, to to have a, a new positive agenda in Libya. Uh, I see at the moment external actors much less involved than in the past. This is very positive because at the regional level, many things have changed. Uh, for example, Egypt and Turkey are now talking. The Gulf, the Gulf power, the Gulf actors are, are less interested in Libya. The position of Italy and France is, is, uh, are, are very closer. Uh, Libya no longer looks like uh, a, a proxy war, but on the other side, it seems more a personal power struggle, a sort of, of, of game of thrones. <laughs> and this is, it is very, very difficult to, to, 
to understand uh, how we can help uh, as European Union uh, Libyans to, 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 to have a new government and to have a new stability. So concluding, I think that Europeans uh, need a strategy, need a new strategy to push the, the new authorities, the authorities, no new authorities, but the authorities, the various authorities to relaunch a constitutional process that can resolve lingering problem and allow Libya to finish its political transition. Because this involves, I think, a more structural approach to enable Libyans to come up with an implemented consensus plan to address some key issues, uh, uh, such as uh, weapon demobilization and security, uh, the economy, the national reconciliation, some important power sharing mechanism. And we, 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 we need to talk about power sharing mechanism. We need to talk about decentralization, I think. And once again, I think a good solution could be a broader forum like, like the, the idea launched uh, in, uh, in Gadamez that never happened. Uh, a, a broader forum that should be considered to bring together different areas of society, armed group and different political uh, parties for, I think, a true national dialogue that can finalize, for example, a new constitution for Libya. This is a way to bypass the, 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 the political problem of, uh, of uh, having uh, uh, Bashaga or or Beba or so we we don't talk we don't we we don't need to talk about people who lead Libya but we we need to uh, try to build institution try to build uh, uh, national sentiment we have to do we have to 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 try to create try to help. Uh, uh, Libya in in uh, in the uh, I think uh, um, uh, in, in creating a nation and in creating a state and I I would be very happy to know what Stefano thinks about it and I add that I, I am, I'm very happy that there uh, there is another Italian scholar to deal with Libya so because Libya is so important particularly for, for Italy and for Europe, but in reality, there are no many Italian scholars that, that, uh, uh, that are dealing with Libya. So uh, thank you very much, Stefano, and uh, welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Artur. You know, you and Stefano bring in a very important uh, <clears throat> matter, which is <clears throat> knowledge. Uh, when NATO and the European Union uh, became involved in 2011 in Libya, it was clear, uh, and, and uh, Ambassador Kretz also brought this up, uh, that the Europeans really thought, the Americans really thought that they knew Libya. And the more they dug into Libya, and particularly at, at the diplomatic and the scholar level, and you brought this up right now, you recognize that they really do not know Libya. The level of knowledge about Libya, its tribes, its structure, its formation, uh, the, the, the regional, um, uh, basically, bonds that they have, which started in 1949 and even before that, when you brought in Cyrenaica, Tripolitania, and the South, that was called at one point the military zone, and then it was later on called Fazan, and you actually put it all together, you find that the formulation of strategy in relation to Libya was premised on very thin knowledge of the historical background of Libya. And it was always uh, that there was a comfort zone and embassies were based in Tripoli. And at one point they had no connection whatsoever with the rest of the world. I remember speaking to the rest of Libya. I remember speaking to ambassadors who never put a foot in other parts of Libya other than coming into the airport collecting a little bit of information in Tripoli and moving. And when the security became unstable in Tripoli, they moved all their resources and bases in Tunis and did most of their meetings and so on outside of Libya. So the, the portrait of knowledge of Europeans and the United States of the history of Libya, the regions of Libya, the formation of the constitution and the evolution of constitutions 
is very, very thin. And you could feel that when you come into meetings, when you go to uh, meetings, whether it is in Europe or the United States or elsewhere, that, wow, there are decisions that are made that influence Libya to that extent that have no knowledge or background of how the country was actually started. And yet it was all assumed to be potentially functional if we do this, if we reform this, we adjust this a little bit. And by the way, we are now unified in Berlin. So maybe we have a better chance at it. The truth is that perhaps, and I refer to Jason Pack here when he talks about the global disorder or the international disorder and how Libya has been in many ways a victim of this disinterest that is produced by the uh, global disorder that exists today. And I think before I get back to Stefano, I think I would like to bring in Wolfgang because we're seeing another focus of global disorder and how it has affected Ukraines. And is there a link between what we're seeing in the Eastern side of Europe and what has happened to Libya in the last 11 years. So uh, without further introduction, I'm going to bring in Wolfgang um, uh, into this conversation. And please take the floor, Wolfgang. Thank you, Hini. At first, please let me congratulate Stefano on his excellent book. It's really an extremely useful book. Thank you very much for this, especially as you are a member of the NCUSLR Advisory Board. Thank you also for being on our board. Russia's Libya strategy in the light of the Ukraine invasion. After the 1969 revolution, Gaddafi sought from almost from the very beginning closer links to the Soviet Union. Further on, the clear majority of the equipment of the armed forces of the Libyan Arab Jamahiriya and the education of most of the officers of all services came from Russia and took place in Russia. This includes also the colonel command of the Libyan National Army, Khalifa Hefta. After the breakup of the Soviet Union, Russia remained as one of Libya's key allies. Just in 2009, two years before the revolution, an arms contract was signed over $4 billion, $4 billion US dollars. In March 2011, under Russian President Medvedev, Putin at this time was just prime minister, Russia allowed UN Council Security Council Resolution 1973 to be adopted by abstaining from the vote, like China. As Stefano said, the Russians thereafter were especially irritated by what they saw as a Western orchestrated replacement of a regime with which Russia had important arms deals in the place. You can read about this more in detail in his book. Russian mercenaries started to support uh, half the Libyan National Army as early as in 2015 but raised to higher public profile only in 2019 during the battle for Tripoli. One could certainly discuss if Russia was Hefta's first choice, but one thing is for sure, at least during the battle for Benghazi, he did not find any other substantial support for his fight against the Islamists in Benghazi and in Burma from the West. Let me have a brief look on Russian strategic interests in Libya. Libya is certainly not, in contrary to Ukraine, certainly not of vital interest for Russia, but it still provides a number of good opportunities for the country's geostrategic ambitions and its weak economy, probably after the war in Ukraine is over even more than before. The establishment of military bases in Libya would allow Russia a better projection of its influence, including in the Mediterranean, Imagine a Russian submarine squadron based in Tobruk, a nightmare for NATO, and it would also serve as a springboard for its ambitions throughout the southern Sahara. Libyan air bases like Al Qadim, just to the south of uh, uh, Al Beda, and Al Jufra, almost in the center of the country, serve already as a stopover for flights to establish and sustain Wagner mercenary operations in other uh, African countries like in the Central African Republic and, since a couple of months, also in Mali. Russia is already present in several of these countries, and the Russian permanent base in Libya would make all these operations much easier and actually would allow for an expansion of activities throughout the African continent. As Stefano wrote, the Italians were always worried about the Russian flanking maneuver against the NATO alliance in the south, 
especially after the intervention in Syria and after the annexation of the Crimean Peninsula. On the economic side, Russia seeks a major share of Libyan reconstruction under advantageous conditions, and it also wants to have its share on the country's oil and gas exploration. Imagine, or better don't imagine, a Russian grip on Libyan gas reserves in the light of the war in Ukraine. Furthermore, Russia seeks to become again a major arms supplier to the Libyan army, which would also facilitate its influence. Russia considers Libya also a, as a battleground against the spread of radical Islam, which is perceived as a threat to Russian interests in the wider region and also to Russia itself. A brief look on the current situation. Wagner, the Russian infamous mercenary company, had just withdrawn a few hundred mercenaries from Libya. But this is mainly infantry from the mobile tactical reserves they were pro providing in the Sirte Basin. There is no change with regard to the much more important support to the Air Force, Air Force technicians, pilots, and other experts serving the crucial air defense systems and other sophisticated weapon systems for the Libyan National Army. So there is no real challenge in the military balance due to the situation in Ukraine right now. And I also don't expect this to happen. Russia has in Ukraine a lack of infantry, but certainly not a lack of Air Force technicians. But this means that the Russian forces, the Wagner forces in Libya can still fulfill their role as a tripwire in the case of a major Turkish supported Operation Volcano Offensive uh, in order to buy some time for an eventual Egyptian intervention. This may be a remote idea right now, but imagine that we would have for the time being two governments and later on the Bashaga government breaks down. Imagine what could have, what could be the impact on the situation in Eastern Libya. Thank you. Looking forward to further discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Wolfgang. Um, well, um, I would like to ask uh, Edward Joseph, our uh, vice president here, to make a few comments before we get back to Stefano. Stefano, you have uh, so many comments that are made regarding your book, um, and um, we're all uh, very curious about your response to all those comments that were made by our distinguished uh, panelists. Uh, Edward, would you like to make a comment, please, on, um, on uh, what you have heard? Yes, uh, Henny, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, pleased to be with you all on this important occasion for two reasons, for the anniversary and of course for Stefano's book. And uh, Stefano, I, I salute you on this book, Felicitazione, uh, complimenti. Uh, this is really a, a great contribution and, and people should truly respect the effort that you put in to uh, documenting and detailing and giving your, your views and perspectives, but uh, documenting this important event. Um, and, and I appreciate, uh, Hanny, your insights and those of all the um, experts on this panel. As you know, um, Hanny, what I know about Libya, I know through you and Wolfgang, uh, principally. And I respect all the perspectives here, Ambassador Kretz, uh, General Whalehill, uh, Wolfgang, all of you um, uh, here. And what I would, uh, and Farida as well, of course, what, what I would do here, my uh, contribution in just a couple of minutes here is to telescope out and um, uh, try to give a perspective from not this uh, granular uh, understanding of, of you all about these um, developments and what the objectives were and what uh, General Wehill and his colleagues in NATO were trying to do and politically not do that, but to telescope out. And, and I'm gonna be uh, very straightforward uh, here, if you'll permit me, Hanny. Uh, I'm sorry to say this, but the 2011 intervention in Libya by NATO and its allies uh, by NATO and, and with the, all the political support, and we didn't even mention the Arab League also supported this. It can be characterized, I believe this is fair to say this in one word, failure. Um, and, and that's not tactical because what uh, AB South and I, I'm former army and I've served at AB South 
and, and served on, on active duty in the Balkans, what, what NATO did technically and tactically was successful. And if we compare to what we see the Russians doing in Ukraine at the moment, uh, it's, there's absolutely no uh, comparison whatsoever uh, there. But uh, otherwise, the, the basic narrative of this intervention, I'm sorry to say, is uh, a, a failure, a, a lesson in what not to do. And I know, um, Stefano, you, you were mentioning, you know, well, we need to apply some of these lessons for other things in the MENA region. I, you know, uh, what Wolfgang says, sure, if Egypt wants to intervene or uh, African Union or something, but uh, I, even with everything going on in Ukraine, I, I believe that the, the takeaway from this is, is don't get in and you don't need to take my word for it. You can take um, none other than President Barack Obama, who I will quote here. Um, we and our European partners underestimated the need to come in full force if you're gonna do this. That's a lesson that I now apply every time I ask the question, should we intervene militarily? Do we have an answer for the day after? The answer Obama has suggested in subsequent interviews, I'm quoting here from his piece, is that we may not have the answer. We're going to have to have some humility in recognizing that we don't have the option of simply invading every country where disorder breaks out. To some degree, the people of these countries are going to have to find their own way. And so R2P, which was already on shaky ground um, after the Iraq intervention, which was not really a humanitarian, but, but it already severely damaged the responsibility to protect uh, after the Iraq invasion and the uh, catastrophic violence there and the insurgency. Um, Libya has just absolutely, uh, the, the aftermath uh, has just really been the poster child in, in don't do this. And so many people have stated the civil war created more casualties than the bloodbath that it clearly would have been in Benghazi. And so that's, uh, I, I hate to say this, but again, this is from the non-expert Libya perspective. It, it really, that's the takeaway here is that um, of a failure. And the only thing, because this is a retrospective event, my, my question, I've asked this of, of many people, um, Henny, uh, uh, including those who are involved in our excellent NC, uh, National Council discussions, I've asked this, and those who were present on the ground at the time of the revolution, um, what, what still baffles me, I, I, and I listened to, to General Wendell on this very closely, I just don't understand to this day how the Iraq, the main Iraq lesson of, and Farida emphasized this and, and was so correct in emphasizing this, but you don't need to be some NATO major general to know this. You, you, anyone should have known this. Any uh, layman would know this. The Iraq experience, the lesson anyone would take away from that is exactly what Farida said. Security, security, security. If you decapitate, and uh, authoritarian regime, in the, in particularly in the Middle East, where we know what the institutions are, and they were much stronger in Iraq than they were in Libya, which we all could have known, and, and which was knowable, not, not you know, by anyone who knew something about Libya should have known that. But certainly, even from the Iraqi perspective, where they had actual institutions in that country, you decapitate that regime, you get chaos. And I, I just... It baffles me, um, and I know I've, I've heard, I've asked this of people, how anyone wouldn't have foreseen that with Iraq having already been the, that searing experience with so much violence. And, and this is and, obviously- uh, yeah. and, and Hattie, I'm, I'll close here. And I, what, what I, I just, it, it seems to me, what, what was foreseeable at the time, and then Hattie, I'll let you and, and the others, to the extent they're interested to address this, why, why people would have accepted, and I know this, I know Libyans, they didn't want any peacekeeping force and uh, they, the you know, legacy of colonialism and all of this stuff, but I don't understand why 
outside interveners wouldn't have said, sorry, we've seen this movie before. It's not a movie we like. And if you want us to intervene, these are our conditions. And, and I don't understand why the United States, which was asked by France and by the UK to, to do this intervention, and Obama what clearly wasn't uh, terribly enthusiastic about it. I don't, and I've asked this of, of senior US officials, including some who are very senior right now in the Biden administration, why the answer wouldn't have been, okay, you want us to go along? We saw the Iraq mission. We're not putting our boots on the ground. How many British police? How many French gendarmes? Where are the Italian carabinieri? Who is going to take care of security in this country with all these militias, all these arms, all that information was known uh, there. Um, and so that's, that's my retrospective question. But I just still remind everyone that the basic takeaway of this mission, I'm sorry to say, was um, tactical success, but political failure. Thank you, Hen. Thank, thank you very much for your comment. Stefano, you allude in your book to the soft and hard force. Uh, this perhaps is a very good time to have you uh, get back on this uh, issue and, uh, and dwell a little bit more. I would like to hear your comment on what Edward just said now and the other prior panelists. Uh, Stefano, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you. First of all, thank you. Thank you all for your kind words, for your appreciation of my work. It means a lot to me. Um, and, and thank you for all of your comments. I mean, if I, if I reply and, and follow up to all of the comments that, that have been made, uh, we will still be here in three hours from now. Um, so I'll try to just make a, a, a few, a few uh, remarks. <clears throat> so the um, General, General Weigel, um, who unfortunately had, had to, to, to go um, to leave us, uh, mentioned uh, the uh, the fact that he he is not convinced that this was that the reconstruction was a NATO responsibility, um, and uh, and in in a sense he's right. He's right in the sense that it was not a responsibility. It was not a responsibility of the armed wing of NATO uh, if there was no follow up to the intervention because the the, the military authorities did in fact prepare plans for that in coordination with the European Union. By the way. Um, but again, this, this, this is a, a, the, the problem. This is a strategic problem. Uh, the fact that the political level and the, the military level um, disagreed among themselves and, and there was this tension and, and this, uh, this very clear um, disconnect, a disconnect between them. Um, it's, a, it's a strategy problem. It contradicts the old uh, Clausewitzian principle that uh, military means are a way of doing politics by different means. So if you want to have a, a successful strategy, not merely for a, a, an intervention, but for the aftermath, if you want to win not just the war, but the peace as well, you need, what you need is robust coordination between the political level and the military level. In that sense, uh, we, can call, we can call it, or we can talk about a strategic, a strategic uh, problem, a strategic mistake, a strategic failure on the part of, uh, of NATO in, in the sense that NATO by then led the international intervention. Um, and again, the, the operation didn't last seven days, it lasted seven months. So there was time, I believe, uh, over those seven months to uh, dig into uh, the options and prepare the ground. And, 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 and despite the fact that uh, it is true, it was not a, a military responsibility uh, for, the authority, for the military authorities of NATO that were conducting the campaign itself, but nonetheless, I'm still convinced that more should have, should have been done in preparing the ground for proper uh, coordinator in multilateral uh, channels to, um, uh, or instruments to channel post-conflict uh, in, in, in a way that could stabilize Libya and provide for a democratic uh, future for the Libya, a better future for, for, for the Libyan people. Um, and, and this brings us really to what Edward mentioned about, uh, so shall we just stay out of the MENA region? Um, and of course that's, you know, looking at what Iraq uh, and, and Afghanistan and Libya told us uh, this is a, a very a, a very understandable tendency. Unfortunately, however, uh, we might even if we don't want to uh, do any more interventions in the broader area, we might have to do something. If not for humanitarian reasons, for blunt uh, and cynic 
maybe even cynic, um, national interests or collective interests, in fact. Um, so you, you really need to, 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 to appreciate the, the, um, the impact and the, the possible um, uh, benefit of, of, of using hard power intended not merely as kinetic force, uh, but as a coordinated uh, uh, economic instruments as well. Um, and the problem is that you may not get to the, po to the point of having to use kinetic force if you use the other tools you have assertively and consistently. Uh, but if you don't do it, you'll get yourself into a situation where uh, you either have to go to go all in uh, to reassert, reassert your presence uh, and, and, and leverage, uh, because there, there, there are players and there will be players ready to do interventions and to exploit the opportunities in that region. So then you either go all in and you have to fight at that point, or you just raise the white flag and try to sneak out, <laughs> hoping that nobody, nobody notices. Um, notices it, uh, and, and unfortunately, I'm not sure that this is an option that uh, that uh, is is um, uh, can be pursued uh, for, forever. Because we see in the current situation uh, the, uh, the 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 energy uh, the energy security problems we are facing. We as as the European Union, but the West more broadly, are are so high that it is really uh, unconceivable that that we can just. No. It's fine. out of, of the region as, as, as a whole. Uh, okay, can you, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you, sorry. Okay, because uh, I'm having some, some issues with the, with the internet connection. Um, now, just a final word maybe uh, following from, from this about the, the current situation in Libya. Um, again, It'll, if you want to hear. Okay, I think, sorry, Jean. Uh, Stefano, we're we we're back to you, Stefano. Can yeah, carry yeah, on yeah, please. absolutely, absolutely, no problem. Yeah. So um, again, flowing from this, uh, this, uh, this 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 problem connected to energy security, um, uh, Europe needs Libya more than uh, than 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 ever now. Um, so I, I I don't expect a change in the uh, in the model or the paradigm uh, in the short uh, in the short term. Right, we're we're losing um, your your voice a little bit. Uh, Jean, can you mute, please? Jean, can you mute mute your phone, please? Yeah. Okay. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah. yeah. All right. Great. Uh, Stefano, I'd like you to uh, give us a uh, sort of your thoughts on how to fix this, how to move forward, uh, based on your experience and knowledge of. Um, of uh, uh, through the book and through the detailed research that you have made. We're now March of 2022. And um, what are your recommendations? How do we fix it? You've heard Farida, uh, everybody wants elections. You've heard Farida also say, we're, we're, we're fed up of those same recycled faces that are be basically forced into this whole process of um, designing the future of, of Libya even at the short term. And yet uh, we see the same faces coming into the conferences, uh, basically the same ideas and so on are rehashed. And you know, everybody knows Einstein's code, you keep on doing the same thing and it fails and you expect it to be better or different is going to be a failure again. So Stefano, share with us in the last few minutes that we have here, what are your recommendations moving forward? Yes, so um, uh, first of all, what I expect the, uh, the European actors and Western actors more broadly to do, uh, it's not so different from what we have seen, unfortunately, uh, especially now uh, with the, the new split in the country between uh, Baiba and Bashaga. Um, unfortunately, you know, all the international organizations involved with the crisis have inaugurated uh, and pursued this tendency, you know, to, 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 uh, of, of waiting for a situation to develop and then just recognize it ex post. You know, it's, it's a de facto acceptance of, of whatever. Um, uh, I don't expect that to change now with the Ukrainian crisis that we have in ha at hand. Um, however, what the, uh, you could and should do, in my view, is to start talking about a multilateral peacekeeping mission if uh, there is another escalation in Libya. Um, it, it doesn't matter too much under which flag. Um, it could be the UN, could be the African Union, could be uh, EU, African Union, UN uh, sort of framework. It doesn't matter too much. Uh, and incidentally, 
Uh, it doesn't need to include so many or any Western, uh, Western peacekeepers, really. Uh, the best peacekeepers, um, precisely because peacekeeping has been deployed so many times in the MENA region uh, and in former Western colonies, uh, are, are not, um, were not done by Western peacekeepers. Uh, the best peacekeepers we have, those with greater experience and, and expertise, come from South America, from Africa, and from South, um, South Asia. Um, but, but, but regardless uh, of who could be uh, asked to uh, provide, uh, to participate, to provide uh, assets and, 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 and personnel for that sort of mission, what matters is to put the option on the table, diplomatically. <laughs> even though it's going to be rejected. But it is important to um, at least to mention it and then mention it again and then again until it becomes part of the, uh, of, of the debate. And the reason for that is that militias in Tripoli are very sensitive and elsewhere in the country are very sensitive. Uh, uh, that is pretty, pretty clear. Um, but that is precisely why, in my view, the EU should say publicly that maybe not now, but if there is another escalation, the EU will sponsor such a mission. Militia leaders and, and Libyan politicians must at least begin to suspect that should they escalate this again, they'll get their worst nightmare. They'll get their nemesis. They'll get international peacekeepers. If they believe this is a concrete possibility, they might feel somewhat deterred. Uh, if they escalate it, they'll get peacekeepers. Uh, they threaten to fire on them, fire will be returned. Uh, I know it's blunt, but uh, and, and we, we know that these militias are highly casualty averse uh, because they are not so strong in numbers. So I think this is a diplomatic trick that it might be used to deter um, um, another um, and discourage another armed escalation in Libya. Well, you, you brought in the issue of peacekeepers on the ground. Uh, what about peacekeeping in the Mediterranean? You, you talked about the failure of Irene, and uh, you know how internationalized the uh, uh, crisis in Libya is. Uh, you know, non-Western, you know, African, other uh, troops are not going to be able to guard your Mediterranean. Uh, is there uh, and will there be a moral and strong will by the Europeans, by NATO and others to really implement uh, the rules that they have recommended in regards to uh, protecting the Mediterranean, uh, not only from the immigrant issue, but I'll, I'm talking about the uh, allowing of uh, military uh, machines and equipment and so on to be brought into Libya and, and accentuate the situation in Libya. I mean, do we have the international will in this chaos that exists to be able to get into ships and so on and prevent the, the uh, uh, mer merchandise of military equipment and so on to come to Libya? Uh, I mean, again, it's, it's, a, it's a question of um, political will, as you correctly say, uh, but also uh, institutional uh, expectations and culture. You know, institutions develop a certain way of doing things, certain expectations, certain uh, cultures, a, a, a certain uh, methods uh, and models. Um, and now shifting an institution or an organization out of that train track is hard, and Libya demonstrates that. The problem with the uh, naval operations in the Mediterranean is precisely uh, that the European Union tends to see itself and to portray itself as a normative power, as a neutral power. But this is a political problem. Uh, the, uh, the failure of the Libyan transition is in so many ways a story of a failure on the part of uh, NATO in, in, the first, in the first place and then the European Union to accept it to play a political role. Uh, they act as technical uh, agencies, but they are not technical agencies. And, and again, I understand all the problems with interacting with so many Libyan factions, uh, the local ownership principle, I mentioned that already, the UN, which is paralyzed by a hostile um, uh, players, hostile to uh, the UN NATO, I mean. Um, so there are a lot of, uh, of problems, but I mean, the, the way to start uh, thinking about it is, uh, you know, we need, we need some teeth of some kind, uh, because you, you can't stabilize a country, you can't stop a militarized escalation when it, when it occurs, uh, and, and, and you can't more broadly stabilize a war torn society with normative concepts, because uh, a, a, a war torn society, a militarized crisis, is a situation where norms and rules have been broken already. 
So you really need to change that paradigm. We've got three more minutes left. I'd like to bring in one minute comment from Wolfgang, Arturo, and Jean, if you don't mind, on, on this uh, last comment that is, is that possible? Is that something that uh, through a political track uh, can be reinforced? Please go ahead. If I may start, I am really not sure how Libya will look like in the next year, but I'm pretty sure in 10 years, Libya will be either a federalist state or broken up after a long and bloody civil war. Right now about Bashar al-Dabeba, I don't expect that there will be two competing governments for a longer period of time. One must not forget, Bashar al-Dabeba is not about East versus West, it's about Misrata versus Misrata. This means one of the both will survive. From my point of view, but it's a Libyan issue. The likeliness that the country could somehow stabilize is better if Bashar is able to take over because he can talk to people in the West and in the East of the country. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Arturo. Can I unmute you? Um, yeah. Yeah. No, yes. Yeah. <laughs> so, no, I agree with Stefano. Uh, I, I think whether the current, uh, um, we know, situation or electoral process uh continuance in some way uh i think there 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 are opportunities for for europe to to help improve libya's voting process for example and and helping the the, the helping the institution because i think that that uh the role of europe and the role of italy in particular is try to 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 help uh libyans to evolve like uh, like like state um, it's very difficult to understand how the situation can evolve, but I think that uh, um, external actors are less involved than in the past, and this is a positive thing. Uh, we need to, to try to, um, to put uh, Libya on, on, on the right way, uh, and I think the, the, the role of Europe could, uh, could uh, help in this more, more than in the past, exactly because the international condition is, 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 was changing very rapidly in the, last, in the last two, three years. And now the conditions are quite bad with respect to the past. Thank you. Ambassador Kretz? Yeah, I, uh, look, I'm, I've, I've, I don't know the, all the, person, the characters now that, uh, that populate the Libyan scene, but I, I'm, I'm I think if we go back to basics, go back to the uh, Constitution of 1954, I think, and then work from there and try to find a common ground with a little bit more knowledge of what each of the parties wants. I think that we'll be able to find some solution that would put uh, Libya back together in some kind of uh, federal state. And to work uh, with these uh, militias, they've got to be brought under control as well. So very well said. Why aren't we going back to the 1951 constitution and building on it? Well, with that comment by our ambassador, I wanna thank everybody who participated. Again, Stefano, congratulations on a wonderful book. It is very timely. It is very soul searching. And I hope we've learned some lessons that we can be positive as we address how the European Union and NATO can be helping in the future in Libya. Thank you again. And then thank, thank you, so you much. Thank everybody. you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Great job, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Hanny. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Bye. Ciao, Stefano. A presto. Bye. Bye. Ciao. Thank you. Thank you so much. Ciao. Ciao. Very much appreciated.